The late evening shadows have brought with them a much-needed breeze that's flowing down from the northwest. We would consider it a, a hot wind, I guess, here. But for them, it's much-needed relief from that blaring sun that's been on them in the wilderness. It'll not only clear the dust off the valley that's been hanging over them like a small cloud, it, it will also sweep through their Bedouin shelters that have almost been unbearable lately, too hot to go inside. It should bring much-needed sleep, a deeper rest than the sweat-filled nights that have passed. But on this evening, sleep won't come to most. In fact, they won't be inside their shelters at all. You will find them in the late hours of darkness, collective in small groups outside. Small groups in the dead of night, all carrying on the exact same conversation. Every one of them coming up with their own ideas. Many just listening for fear of putting out a possibility that would be, well, that will be turned gravely wrong tomorrow. And around every group, as far as the eye can see, in the dark of night, there's one question. How do you think he's going to come? You see, you got to go back and realize they have no clue who this God is. You, you see, you understand this, this group of Israelites were sitting as slaves in Egypt until some bearded shepherd with a stick came out of nowhere and said, I was called by the one almighty God to free you. <laughs> Wacko. Until his stick becomes a snake, until water turns to blood, until darkness covers the land, until locust, until plague after plague. Your eyes are open. You don't know this, God. Your people have been slaves in Egypt for over 400 years. You've got no church. You've got no Bible study. But you've got 10 signs of the power and might of this God and a bearded dude up front with a stick saying, he talks to me. He splits the Red Sea and brings you out of the land. It's been three months now in the wilderness. When you were thirsty, water came from the rock. When you were hungry, there was food on the ground. And now bearded dude with a stick stands in front of you and says, God just spoke to me again. And you're sitting there by this time going, well, we believe it. We've seen some freaky stuff happening the last few months. And bearded dude with a stick now tells you, in three days, God wants to show up so all of you can see him and talk to you. Shut the front door. Are you serious? Seriously? You, this God, the signs, the pictures, the wonders. They, shh, shh. Three days, he says, he'll show up. There's no Bible. As we saw a couple weeks ago, Moses is writing the Bible during this journey. He's not doing it page by page and handing them out. They've got no experience. They've got no upbringing. They've seen signs. Can you imagine for three days, late into the night, although your body craves sleep, the conversations of how do you think he's going to pull this off? The most creative ones and probably the extroverts are always talking. The introverts are just taking it all in. The processors are just listening, going, you're stupid, you're stupid, and I don't even care what you're saying anymore. And every personality type in some way, shape, or form or another is involved in this conversation. If we've seen plagues, if we've seen glimpses of the power of this God, and he's going to show up, how do you think it's going to happen? You think the heaven as we know it would just split and a big face would appear? Bearded, sort of like Moses, just bigger? You think he's going to come down on a chariot pulled by 31 unicorns, all of different colors? with flames and coming out of their wings. And how does he show up? My bet is how he chose to do it. Not a one of them had come up with the night before. Tomorrow they're going about to get their answer. And tomorrow they're not going to like fully their answer. 
And we go to these stories because I firmly believe he is the same God. He hasn't changed. He hasn't gotten smarter. He hasn't gotten wiser. He hasn't figured out people better. North Coast, whatever campus, whatever venue, you've probably had a thought at one point or another. Why doesn't God just show up? I wish God would just show himself. I just wish God would appear. After this story, you may never say that again. Because my bet is the way God showed up then is the way God shows up now. Because the way God dealt with people is the way God deals with us. This is your story. It's the second book of the Bible. It's chapter 19, and it's going to be a good one. Exodus 19, second book of the Bible. While you're turning there, let me welcome Fabric and Carlsbad and San Marcos Escondido. We were hanging out with you guys last week and amazing stuff happening at those places for Green Oak, for Kailua, for all of our men and women that are watching all throughout this incredible globe that are serving our country and others that are joining us. We love what you do and the sacrifice you and your family and spouses back here are making. We're in Exodus 19. Moses has led the Israelites out to this mountain, out in the wilderness. They've got out of the slavery. The plagues have happened. And now in 19, God says... It's time you know the type of God you're following. Yeah. Now, in the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. And after they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai. And Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. And Moses went up to God. And the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Moses, it's time to tell the people a few things about me. And here's how we're going to start. In front of the mountain, in the wilderness, there in your Bible, you might want to just write Exodus 3, 11 through 12. Circle there in the desert in front of the mountain. Exodus 3, 11 through 12. It's the same book. You can do this. We're going back. 16 chapters. 3, 11 through 12. 16 chapters to your left. The last time Moses encountered this God in this place, it was in a burning bush. It was the first time Moses encountered God. And the bush spoke to Moses from the flames. Take off your shoes. You're in holy ground. This is what I want you to do. Go set my people free. And watch what happens in chapter 3, 11 through 12. It says this. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Why in the heck are you picking me? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. We're starting where we started. They're back at the foot of the mountain. And Moses is the only one that knows I'm starting exactly where we started. He's still very much a shepherd, if you will. He's he's leading a different flock in the exact same place he started some 16 chapters ago. I wonder, I wonder if there's an evening where Moses is walking outside his tent and just grabs a few of his buddies. Hey, guys, just, you guys, you got anything going on right now? Can you just... Let's be fun. Follow me. Just don't tell anybody where you're going. We'll be back soon. And they walk a little distance outside of the camp. They walk up one of the mountain paths. And there Moses stops in the middle of stark nothingness and says, that's it. And his buddies are looking going, that's what, Mo? That's the bush. Shut up. You mean the little story about the burning bush talking? That's it. Can we touch it? You can do it. It's just a bush. There's a bunch of them around here. But this is where God said, you are the most unlikely of people. You don't have what it takes. And you think you've already blown your life and you have no shot at redemption. Here's your sign, Mo. The next time I see you back here, you're going to be with a big group of people and you're going to worship me. I'm running your show as long as I'm running you. This is that sign. This is that 
place. And my bet is North Coast, on all of our campuses and venues, there are some of you today that are waiting for God to show up. There are some of you today that need a God moment. There are some of you today that say, I've heard the rhetoric, I've seen the stories, I just want to know, when is God finally going to show up? And I want to run through how he showed up then, because my bet is, this is how God shows up today. Number one in your note sheets to write it down is simply this. God showing up always includes God as the starting point. You want God to show up in your life, I promise. It's going to include God as the starting point. Look how he starts here in the verses we just read. He goes, I want you to go tell Israel, you know what I did. You know how I brought you out of Egypt. You know how I carried you on eagle's wings. You know what I've already done. This is how God works in our life. God doesn't start with, hey, guys, listen up. Get some pen and paper or something to write with. This is what you must do to please me. No, God says, you start with what I've already done. Anything we do in our Christian life is simply a response to what he's already done. In your note sheet, I wrote it there, 1 John 4, 7 through 19, that simply says God is love. We love because he first loved us. Because he first loved us. I grew up in a church that got this one wrong. It's one of the reasons I hated church, one of many. Because I grew up in a church that constantly preached what we must do to deserve God's love. What we must do to please God. What we must do to be in relationship. And it's a never-ending book of rules and laws and command. Peace out. No one ever told me what scripture said. Chris, you don't have a prayer of pleasing God. You know why you're going to love him, though? Because of what he's already done for you. You know I got this wrong as a youth pastor? I felt many times like I should go back and try to call up every kid in my first six years of youth ministry and say, I'm sorry, I think I blew this. I was trying to teach you how to walk in obedience. I was trying to teach you how to serve God. I was trying to teach you how to obey God. When I should have just been teaching far more, here's how much this stinking God loves you. Here's what he's already done to get to you. Because anything now the Bible asks me to do is a response. God showing up always starts with him as the starting point. Moses, you tell them what I've already done. You explain everything they've seen in the last three months was simply done so I could have them before we get to anything, before we get to the commandments that are about to come. None of it makes sense unless you know who this God is and what he's already done. North Coast, we talk a lot on obedience. We say it unashamedly, unapologetically, and jokingly. Hey, I bet we're going to talk about obedience this week. Because there's nothing else outside of that. Obedience is just how I keep walking in my relationship with God. What I continue to do to have this incredible relationship with God so I'm not the one straying away. And I hope we do it enough, but I don't know if we can ever do it enough to come to the point of saying, it's not about us working for God. It's the work he's already done. And because of that, I can't help but go, well, you got the wrong guy. But you know you got the wrong guy. And as long as you want this wrong guy, let's do your show. It's a response to what he's done. Secondly, in this, when God finally shows up, it's an invitation to relationship. It's an invitation to relationship. He says in 19, in chapter 19, this is what you are to say in the verse, my eyes, it's too far away from me. Verse 3. Has anybody ever turned 40 and you lost your eyeballs? <laughs> Something happened, man. I hit that 40 zone a couple years back and all of a sudden I'm like, man, who changed the print in my Bible? <laughs> this is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. 
Oh, he's about to get deeper in this. We're going to explode this. For now, I just want you to write it down. It starts with what God has done, and it's an invitation to a relationship with him, an invitation to have this incredible access to the one true God. He doesn't say, Moses, we're about to set up a religion. Moses, we're about to set up a bunch of rules. Moses is a bunch of laws. He goes, Moses, we're about to enter into relationship. And like any great relationship, there's going to be boundaries. You cross those boundaries, my bet is you're going to blow up your relationship. You stay within these boundaries, you're going to have an incredible relationship. But it starts with what God has done and what he wants from us and with us. It's simply an invitation to relationship. I felt like my church growing up got this one wrong. No one really got down and said, Chris, this isn't what is good for God. This is what is great for you. Knucklehead, you don't get this yet. But this God created you, made you to be the way you are because he actually likes you the way you are. I know not many people in life like you the way you are at this point. God does. And he's got a purpose for you. It's a relationship. Moses, for the last three months, we've had some amazing conversations. This is no longer about you and I. I want you to let the people know I'm about to show up. If you want God to show up in your life, it starts with knowing what he's done for you, how much he loves you in spite of who you are, and that you're called to a relationship. And then he says this, now, if, I can't stress this enough, circle, highlight, underline, star, permanent marker, highlight marker, different colored pen, smiley face, if, you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then, I can't stress this enough, circle, highlight, underline, star, asterisk, double underline, smiley face, arrow, word says, don't miss this, then, out of all nations, you are going to be my treasured possession. Although the entire earth is mine, you're going to be for me a, a kingdom of priest, a holy nation. You're going to be set apart, separate, holy. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and he summoned the elders and the people and he set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. And the people all responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Thirdly, after it starts with God at the starting point, an invitation to a relationship with his God, he gives us an if-then statement. An if-then statement. If You want to enter this relationship, then here's what I'm going to give you. But it's an if-then statement for us. He says, I'm going to ask you to give up ownership of your lives. You no longer have your hopes, your dreams, your American dreams. You're going to see your life as mine because of what I did, because I bought you out of slavery, because I set you up in the land of freedom, because of what I've done. Here's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to give you all of me. I'm going to give this incredible relationship, but it's an if-then statement. If you surrender yourself and you say, I do, and God says, I've already bought the ring. I've already paid for it. If you accept this, then out of the entire world, you are my treasured possession. You're going to be holy, set apart, different from others. We're going to have this relationship. But it's a choice you're going to have to make. And you go, well, Chris, you're getting a little carried away. That's to the nation of Israel. Well, not the nation of Israel. Correct. And yet the New Testament makes it incredibly clear. This is now an invitation to all of us that we are grafted into this. It's Jesus himself that stood there and simply said, anyone who wants to save his life must lose it. He goes, give it to me. He goes, you're allowed to keep your life, but in the end, you're going to lose it. So you might as well lose it to me now. I mean, what does it gain to get your American dream and lose your soul anyway? He goes, you got to give up your life to follow me. Give it to me. Give it to me. Or what Paul will write in the New Testament, you've got to make yourself a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing. He said, God, I belong all to you. I'm going to manage this life. And this is the point in these conversations. We're going to sit there and go, man, that's really hard to do. Does God really expect us to surrender, to tap out and say it's all yours? I live for you. I just manage this the way you want me to manage life? Seriously? My job, my employer, my employees, my finances, my spouse, my sexuality, my relationships, my anger, my words, my vocabulary, my entertainment. Yeah. Do you have any idea how hard that is? (laughs) Daily. 
How tough that is, of course. How incredibly unfair of a contract that seems for God. I guess you can put it that way. You can go back to slavery. Or you can walk with him. It's the same invitation, folks. He goes, and let me tell you, if you do this, then, fourthly, you're going to have a new purpose and identity. You're going to have a new purpose and identity. I'll read 1 Peter 2.9. It's, it's also there in your notes. It's not there in your notes. You should write it down under new purpose and identity. Because, again, some of you may go, and that's Old Testament. What about us? Peter writes it this way. Now you... If you're a believer and follower of Christ or a chosen people, you are the royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this incredible light. Now you are that royal priesthood. That's where some of you are like, I don't think I want to be a priest. <clears throat> No, understand that word, <clears throat> not maybe how it's changed in 2,000 years. It's not about a position of, of someone that serves in a church that has priests. He goes, a priest is someone that has direct access to God, one that's a mediator with God, one that now can show people, tell people how to have access to this God. He goes, that's what you are. You're going to have a new purpose that you now may declare the praises of him who called you, that you are going to live a different life than the rest of your coworkers, the rest of your classmates, that you are going to live the type of life where people are going to come up and go, hey, I don't mean to be rude, but I want to ask a question. What the heck's the matter with you? What do you mean? I don't know. You just don't fit in. And your response is thanks because my whole purpose in life is not to fit in. Well, you're doing a heck of a job. I appreciate that. Why are you different from most? Why after work do you love going home to your spouse when the rest of us take a several hour detour why every time we bring up certain conversations do you back out of the conversation you actually seem like you love your kids even the small ones that just wear the plastic zip zip tie tie things that just stink <laughs> why do you have such a strong commitment to go to a place on the weekend that it keeps you from hanging out with us at times because I have a new purpose. He gave me a new identity, and that identity is now you leave this place. You don't come here to hear from a priest. You leave these campuses, and you become the priest. You now show. You now mediate. You now have this incredible relationship with God, and now you show family and friends. This is what it looks like. What's going on with your life? Well, see, there's the thing. I died about seven years ago. Shut up. No, seriously. How'd that happen? I was in church and some dude's doing a story and it just hit me and I just, I died. How'd they bring you back to life? No, I just kept beating. I kept breathing. But I finally got to a point on that day where I said, I'm done with Chris. So I gave him up. I signed over the pink slip. I died to myself so that I may live. And the life that I now live I simply live in this flesh and by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's the craziest thing. I don't expect you to understand, but you can come with me. It's my job. I'm a son or you're a daughter to show people who your father is out of the entire world. You are one of the most valuable, dangerous people that walk the face of the earth. Because of the price tag your dad has not put on you. That's my boy. That's my girl. You mess with her, you mess with me. He cannot, will not ever take his eyes, his hands off of you. Psalms 139. If you want to follow me and stay with me, then here's what you get. Does he know it's unfair? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Does he know this is going to be hard for you? Yes. Does he know he's asking for a really tough thing? Yes. That's why he's about to pull off what he's about to pull off. And of course, the people are, tell God, we'll do everything he says, because that's your only response for about 10 pages, and then they screw up. Here we go. We'll get to it. Isn't it amazing, though, how you can come to a place, come to church, just be so rocked by God, I'm going to do everything until you get to what, Melrose? 
San Marcos, Escondido, until you get to what, Nordahl? And you're like, I was my eye watering. I'm just thinking about where we're going to eat right now. Hey, there's Hooters. <laughs> San Marcos. Fallbrook, is it still La Casita? I don't know. Isn't it amazing how you can encounter this living God and be in a place and say, God, whatever you want, what do you mean for the next four blocks? Man, then I get back out there. I love the reality of the Bible with these people because it fits me. This is good. You ready? Give me good. Now the Lord said to Moses, verse 9, I'm going to come down to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. And Moses told the Lord, Moses told the Lord what the people had said. Hey, the people said they're all in. Whatever they say, you're going to do. And God's like, yeah, right. And the Lord said to Moses, now you go tell the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready on the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai on the side of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you don't go up the mountain or even touch the foot of it, because whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Death. Does yours say death? I thought it was a misprint. He shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on him. Whether man or animal, he shall not be permitted to live. Only when a ram's horn sounds a long blast, may they go up to the mountain. And after Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day and abstain from sexual relations. What? There's two things I don't like in there now. <laughs> you first of all you guys got a little league team yeah we got the little israel junior league you got that little machine with the chalk line can you just go around the front of the mountain and just tell them if they step over that they're going to get killed but i don't want you to like to strangle them i want you to like shoot them with an arrow hit them with like a heavy brick <laughs> i'll tell them don't bring their pets because you know how dogs kind of run around or chase things if a dog crosses the line you got to kill him too Scruffy? Yeah, don't bring Scruffy to this. What? What ticked off God? What? Why did he get so grumpy? Put a line and tell him in three days I'll come down. So Moses tells the people, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put a line. You cross it. I'm sorry, we've got to kill you. And they're like, all right, where's that line? Be clear on that one. <laughs> here's the other thing. You've got to wear your best stuff, but clean it ahead of time. Wash it. You're going to try to be as pure as you can, as clean as you can. Oh, and there's one more thing. Um, you can't have sex until this happens. And dudes are like, did that just start now, or do we got like a 15-minute head start? <laughs> Seriously? And you're looking at this like I am, and I'm like, what's up with that? North Coast, we've got to get back to the Word of God. You cannot have sexual relations from Thursday through Saturday if you're coming to church. We'll be down to one venue, won't we? <laughs> and I won't be teaching it. I'm like, how's that church going? <laughs> what is this about? It's, never, it's nowhere else in the Bible. It's, that. it's for this time, for this place. This is descriptive, not prescriptive. This is God just saying, I want you to clean yourselves up. There's nothing wrong with sexual relations. God made them. God invented them. Page two, he said, it's great. I just outdid myself on this one. This is phenomenal. But I want you to take this one seriously. And in three days, I'm going to show up. And I want you to get your mind right. I want you to get your body right. I want you to get your clothes right. I want you to get as clean as you can. And even then, if you step over the line, you're going to get killed. Can you imagine the conversations around those places for the next two days? What is he going to do? Oh, my gosh. What's he gonna, I just can't. Oh. <laughs> now, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, and everyone in the camp trembled. And Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire, and the smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. And Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. And the Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai. And he called Moses at the top of the mountain. And Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, You better go back down. 
And you got to warn the people so they don't force their way through to see the Lord. Because many of them will perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, man, the, the people can't come up to Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us, put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. He's like, God, I told them that. No one's coming up. And the Lord said, no, you go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and he told them once again, Moses comes up and the fire comes down and it's smoke like a furnace. And there's lightning and there's thunder and the mountain starts shaking violently. And there's a line and there's a trumpet blast. And God calls Moses up just to tell him, go back down. He's like, I just got up here. Remember, he's always 80 something at this time. He's like, go back down for what? Tell the people they really can't cross that line. I did that. We're good. No, there's going to be a couple days from now. Some dude sitting around playing poker. Someone's going to get a bright idea. Hey, Jimmy, Jimmy, why don't you go up and get a peek of God? And Jimmy's throwing a couple back, and he's going to think, maybe I should. Because there's always a Jimmy in the crowd. Man, I was hoping to get some. Thank you, Jimmy. So it's poor people sitting next to him are like, it's true. That's the guy. It's good. I want you to go back out and tell him again, I'm really serious about this one, Mo. He's like, I'll do that. I'll bring Aaron with you. Got it. What? Man, this is different from how we portray God, how we think about God. See, God showing up always includes an appropriate fear of God. An appropriate fear of God. God says, I'm going to show up and I'm going to scare you to death. You did a heck of a job. I've heard how they've been thinking. Some idiot thought I'd come down with 31 unicorns and a chariot of fire. <laughs> He's about to wet his pants. They crossed the line. They're dead. I don't even want you to touch him dead. <laughs> dead. You can't come away. He goes, no, I'm God. You can't touch this. You can't get a glimpse of this. Your peon created Plato brain cannot comprehend the size of your God. In fact, I'm going to cover myself through the fabric of what I've created. Some of the most majestic and awesome, ferocious fabric of my creation. I will clothe myself so you can hear the voice of creator but not see him. But this is how he shows up. Have you ever just wanted God to show up? Have you ever just said, God, I just want to see you? Knock it off. Because I think if God ever showed up to you, he would do it just to scare the hell out of you. That's his purpose. Spoiler alert. That's his purpose. Read. Next chapter, chapter 20, 10 commandments. They're about to come. End of the 10 commandments. 20 verse 20. 20 verse 18. This is next week, but we're going to hit the Ten Commandments. So 20, verse 18, very next chapter. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. Do you think? They stayed at a distance and said, Moses, you speak to us yourself and we'll listen, but don't have God speak to us because we're going to die. <laughs> and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Don't be afraid now. <laughs> but he wants to show you a glimpse of his power and might so that it will literally scare the hell out of you. So that when you want to sin, when you want to do wrong, this fear of this God, the line that you are about to literally cross, will always be in your mind. Deuteronomy 4, he picks up the exact same story and he re 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 explains the exact same thing. <laughs> Reiterates. Mm, I know big words, more than two syllable. Yes, more than two syllable. He reiterates the exact same thing. God didn't show up in a form of him that you could make an idol out of. He clothed himself in this, in this, in this ferocious awe. Because there's going to be many days where you're going to want to cross the line. And this is going to keep you from doing it. It's an appropriate fear of God that at times is more powerful than a love for God. Our worship songs by our amazing worship teams who put their heart and soul into leading us and preparing. 
But the vast majority of our worship songs are about God loving us or about us loving him. We sing very few songs about fearing God. And yet 144 times in the Bible, one, four, four times in the Bible, it says we've got to have a fear of God. Proverbs 1, 7 says the fear of God is actually the beginning of wisdom. He's not an angry God. He's not out to hurt anyone. Moses says, no, 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 you don't have to be afraid of him. Just know this is the God that if you ever step over the line, that's when you should fear God. And you go, Chris, that's so Old Testament. It's in Joshua chapter 24. Um, We can do this. Leave something here in Exodus. Turn a few pages to Joshua. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We're in Joshua chapter 24. The people have gone through the wilderness. The people disobeyed God. The people didn't trust God. So the people wandered for 40 years. They come to the end and they're finally going to get in this incredible promised land that God's going to give the nation of Israel. And at the end of that time, their new leader after Moses is Joshua. He's about to pass on. He's about to die. And he calls the people together again. And in Joshua chapter 24, starting verse 14, he says this. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all your faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you serve. Whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. But as for me, as for my household, we are going to serve the Lord. And then the people answered, no, no, far be it from us to forsake the Lord and to go to other gods. The Lord, our God himself, who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our very eyes. He protected us on this entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the other nations, including the Amorites who live in this land. We too are going to serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua says, guys, it's time for you to get serious and fear the Lord. And the people are like, yeah, 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 we love God. Well, we're going to follow him. And look at Joshua. Joshua said to the people, no, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion, your sins, if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods. He will turn and bring disaster on you and, and, and make it the end of you after he's been good to you. Joshua says, you, can't, you don't understand what you're saying. You want a God you can control. You can't control this God. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said, okay, now you're witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yeah, we're witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away all your foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord, our God, and obey him. And Joshua knows they don't get it. He goes, you don't fear God. Oh, no, no, we want to follow God. He goes, I know, but you don't fear God. You're not going to do this. You want a God you love. You want a God you can control. Now, people, this is one side today. We're talking about the fear of God. We have talked a lot about loving God and God's love for us. Of course, that's huge. But it is a both and. It's two sides to the exact same God. He's not an angry God. But he's a ferocious God. You go, Chris, that's Old Testament. In Luke 12, 4 through 5, I put it in your notes. Jesus simply says this. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of men who can kill the body and after that can do no more to you. But I'm going to show you whom you should fear. You fear him who, after killing the body, has the power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, you better fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by this God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. And there's that contradiction. Jesus says, you shouldn't fear anybody on earth. You know who you should be afraid of? God, who has the power after this life to throw into hell. That should scare the hell out of you. But you should also know, if you are following him, Then, out of this entire world, if he knows where the sparrows go, how much more his children? And we have this incredible picture of loving God, but the size of this God that is awe-inspiring. 
It's Acts 9.31, encouraged by the Holy Spirit. The church grew in number, living in the fear of the Lord. The New Testament church, after Jesus came, died and rose again. The New Testament church, encouraged by the Holy Spirit in their lives, grew in numbers because they feared God. So how do we put this together today? See, my... uh, <clears throat> my note sheet, I put an appropriate fear of God simply because my kids have a fear that goes with being my kids. My kids aren't afraid of me. My kids don't walk on eggshells around me. I'm not an angry dad. I'm not a dad that will react to them in, 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 any, in any harsh way. But my kids better fear me When my kids don't fear me, I no longer have any authority or control with my kids. They love me. I love them. But the day my 10-year-old bear decides to play with the lighter and the side of the couch is lit on fire, his first thought should be, Dad, this fear of Dad Because he's just crossed a line we've made incredibly clear. You never cross. Moses says he's not an angry God. Don't fear him, but live in fear of stepping outside. I threw it in your note sheet, these ton of verses under the fear of God, because some of you are going to be like, that doesn't sound right. That's not the God I know. I love this other God. Read these. And one of those I want you to read is Hebrews 12. I wrote it down in your note sheet, 1 through 29. It says, God will discipline us like any great father disciplines his kids. What father actually loves his kids if he doesn't discipline them? So when you feel like you're being disciplined from God, you should rejoice that you're in a relationship where your dad wants you back and will do anything to straighten you out and get you back. It says, now they approached God in thunder and lightning and smoke and a furnace and were scared to death. He goes, we can approach God in boldness. We are called sons. We are called daughters. We can walk. Revelations 4 or 5, I put in your note sheet. We can walk to the throne of this God because you are his son. You are his daughter. And then it ends, because our God is a consuming fire. (laughs) That's good? No, no. That's great. You have a God that's just laid down a contract. This is what I've done to get you. This is what I'm inviting you to. This is what you're going to have to give up. This is what I'm going to make you. That's going to be tough. That's going to be hard. Let me, in three days, give you a glimpse of the size of the God that's asking you into this relationship. That's who you pray to. That's who you walk with. Some of us have relegated mentally our God to a a long white skirt wearing Jesus who pets lambs. That is no God. That was God who set aside his ferociousness to come to earth to show us how we live as people. But that is not an image of God. That is an image of how we live as people. But we see Jesus as, well, that's my God. Boy, I tell you, this West Texas boy growing up needed something a little more powerful than a long white skirt wearing lamb petting Jesus. Because I'm going to get to places in my life where I want to cross the line. I'm going to get to places in my life where I want to live across the line. And I'm going to get to places where you're asking for my life, my talents, my gifts, my treasures. You're asking for my wife and my kids, and I'm supposed to serve and follow you. I better have a bigger God than that. Isn't that awesome? And we've got it a little backwards nowadays. In our, our adult, we still have flannel graph. Did you ever go up with flannel graph board? The little board in church where they stuck the little characters? In our adult churches, we've got the wrong flannel graph. We've got, well, we've got this. We've got this flannel graph of God that's just a little bit backwards. Maybe it's a lot backwards. We, we've got this flannel graph of God where he shows up in clouds. It's a nice cloud. (laughs) And who is this God? Man, this is a God that loves you. This is a God that you want to be with. This is a, 
This is a God that more than anything just kind of resembles uh, just sort of a, a big cuddly teddy bear. But, it, but it's, it's, it's a big teddy bear that, that kind of comes down with hot air balloons. And if God was going to show up, how would God show up? He's just going to be this big, cuddly God that floats down and just goes, today you get free hugs. Today everyone gets free hugs. And on your way out of, of, of hugging God, he's, he's going to also just say, you can, you can also just, you, you get to slide down rainbows today. You come to God and you, you get a hug and you, you slide down rainbows and, and I'll be sexist. I don't care. All the women go down this rainbow and at the end of that rainbow, there'll be dark chocolate waiting for you. <laughs> and I want all the guys to slide down this rainbow and on this rainbow, there'll be a steak just waiting for you. <laughs> and on the third day, everyone stood out there and this giant cuddly God came down with balloons that were too numerous to count and rainbows shot out of all sides and you could hug God as many times as you wanted and you could slide down rainbows and there was all the dark chocolate and steaks that you could eat. <laughs> and the entire air was filled with the worship of angels that people joined in that sounded a lot like this. And it was the best day with God. And forever we're going to see songs about cuddling with this God. And I guess he could have. I guess he could have. But he didn't, did he? This God shows up and says, I'm asking for your life. And I'm about to give you the guidelines for living with me. And you're going to daily want to cross them and make your own guidelines. And this will not give you conviction or accountability. I want a God I can control. Israel wanted a God they can control. And Joshua says, that's not the God you get. Jesus says, you want to fear someone. This isn't what you fear. On the third day, there was a line that said, you can't cross this. And on the third day, God showed up. And he split the fabric of his creation to give his creation a glimpse of creator. And using what they could at least see and know and understand, there was thunder and there was lightning and there was an earthquake and there was flames and smoke shot up like smoke billowing from a furnace. Oh, and the air was filled. But it wasn't the songs of Smurf praising God. The earth was simply filled with this. And there's a trumpet blast. And it grew louder and louder until a voice of God said, Moses, come on up. He said, Moses, I want you to go back down the mountain and I want you to put signs up. I want you to remind my kids their dad is a high voltage God. You want the truth? You can't handle the truth. <laughs> so you stay out there and you catch a glimpse of the size of the God that says, out of everyone, you, you I'm going to be in love with. You are my treasured possession. Chris doesn't need to surrender to a cuddly God. Chris needs this. On days where I'm alone at the computer, when relationship or desires, Chris needs this. To say, I know what he did for me. May I remind you, in Mark chapter 9, it's on the mountaintop, Jesus with Peter, James, and John, lightning shot out of Christ. It's called the transfiguration. It's in your note sheet. Why? Was that a miracle? No. The miracle is Philippians 2. Jesus set aside being this. Jesus set aside being this to come to walk earth as a man. And for a moment on Mark chapter 9 on the mountaintop, this started to break through the pores of his flesh. And the God that has been concealed started to rip through skin and bone. 
And his disciples caught a glimpse of the type of Jesus they are following. Church, we need this. I need this for my trust and my confidence. I need this for moments where I want to tempt hell or taste hell to scare the hell out of me. Say, God, I'm yours. And Moses said, that's why he showed up. That's why he did what he did. See, in taking it home, there's a big difference between knowing God, knowing about God, and knowing God. North Coast, there's a huge difference between knowing about God and knowing this God. This is your father. This is your relationship with the creator of the universe that spoke things into being. And out of all people, he wants you to be a treasure possession, a relationship. He wants you to know what he's already done for you. It's an if-then statement. And we got to walk in an appropriate fear of this God. Otherwise, we play with our idols, knowing big teddy bear is going to be cool with me because I slide down rainbows and get dark chocolate. That is not the God of the Old Testament. That is not the God of the New Testament. He's a consuming fire that I can approach. And when someone says, you can't cross that line, I say, I'm New Testament. I run across the line. I'm his son. That's my father. We're in relationship. <clears throat> father, may we continue to be a people that teach of your love and our love for you. But God, may it not be a duty. May it be a response because of what you have already done for us. And in this incredible relationship where we can have access to you, may we never forget the glimpse of the size of God that you are. You are a jealous God. You are a father that will discipline. May we not fear you. May we fear the consequences of you if we ever cross the line. And God, may you bring us back into your arms. I don't get this. I don't understand it. I know I do not deserve it. So today we simply say thank you for offering it to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as you go, there's times where I'm driving and some of you pull up behind me. And we got about 120 of you that uh, drive the cars that have the lights on top and are black and white and big emblems on the doors. I want you to know, I don't fear you. I don't fear your car. I don't fear your lights. I don't fear your badge. I don't fear your uniform. It's that little book that you start writing in. Because when I see you writing in that book, no matter how good of a story I got, I'm like, it's done. They're writing in that book. If you just got rid of that book, I would love you so much more. <laughs> when you pulled me over in traffic from then on, I'd be a little annoyed. Hey, you're going fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have a good day. Me too. And I'm going to keep speeding. Because it's not you I fear. It's the consequences that you have the authority over me that I fear. And that keeps me most of the time within speed limit range. <laughs> it's not a God I fear. It's the size of this God, his magnitude, what he's done for me. And knowing if I decide to write my own rules and limits, the consequences that come. I love this God. Church, I love fearing this God. That's my dad. And you can't touch him. He's high voltage. There's warning signs around and on the cross, Jesus said, it's finished. You now have a relationship. You can approach him. But don't ever ask him to show up. It would scare the bejeebies out of you. It would be meant to. That's God. We're going to pick it up from there next week. Until then, turn around. Greet somebody that now has the fear of God in them. <laughs> See you next week.